Assalamu alaikum and welcome to the next edition of Faith Matters. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank all our viewers who've been actually emailing in with a lot of vigor, I must admit. We have been inundated with questions and my jazakumullah to all of you for sharing with us in what we hope to make an even more better and informative and indeed interactive program. So my thanks go to you. I mean, questions are quite profound, are they not? Does faith matter? What is faith? Why are there so many faiths in the world? And what does that faith constitute? This and many other questions we hope over the course and series of this programs to be answering. And there is already great interest in faith as we look around the world, whether it's from a contemporary sense or indeed from a religious sense. Faith, whether you believe in it or not, matters. And faith matters are important to everyone. I was actually reminded by a friend of mine once when he said, what is faith about? And another one retorted and said, faith is like electricity. You can't see it, but you can feel it. And with that introduction, we'll move forward into some of the questions we've had. Just to sort of give viewers a feel, last uh, time round, we were talking about particular uh, questions relating to this whole issue of loyalty to nation and the loyalty particularly of members of Jamaat Amdiya to uh, their country, wherever that country will be. Indeed, many people I know raise the questions of when they come to our events, they often see whether it's in the United Kingdom, the British standard being raised, elsewhere in Germany, in India, in Pakistan, wherever it will be, wherever a convention is held, be it youth or otherwise, we're always demonstrating, not just outwardly, but also intrinsically, our loyalty to nation. And in that regard, maybe if we can take a step back into history, Bajwa Saab, if I, as alaykum, begin yeah, with yourself. Um, one of the questions which is often raised about the Jamaat Ambiya is the concept of the relationship Hazrat Masih Maulid had with the British government, indeed his praise of the British government at that time. Could you perhaps sort of throw a bit of light on that? <coughs> yes, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. <coughs> Tariq Sahib, uh, before the advent of Hazrat Masih Maulid the situation was this that uh, before British government, there was a Sikh rule in India. And in those days, there were so many restrictions on the Muslims that they were not free to practice their religion. Hazrat Masih al Islam saw that period. Now after that, when the British came, they gave full freedom to the Muslims and also other uh, followers of other religions that they can practice their religion as they like. Now when Hazrat Masih Osam saw this difference, at one side the time of the Sikh rule, on the other hand the time of the British rule, so he was really thankful to Allah the Almighty, basically, that God Almighty has changed the circumstances and now the Muslims and other people are free to practice their religion. In fact, this is the teaching of Islam that uh, everybody should have the freedom of religion. As the Holy Quran says, La ikraha fi deen, there is no compulsion in the matter of religion. So in fact this uh, is something uh, belongs to Islam but British government followed it and this is very good, we are very pleased to say that. Now the, at the same time, the Holy Quran, the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has said Man lam yashkure nasa lam yashkure Allah He who is not grateful to people, he is not grateful to Allah. So now when Hasp. Muslim saw, saw that the British, British uh, government has done a great favor to the uh, to his just subject. So automatically, being a man of God, he was he should have been the first person that he should thank uh, Allah, but at the same time he should thank thank the British government as well. Now this is one side of the picture, <clears throat> but on the other hand, we should not forget it that as far as the Christianity is concerned, Hazrat Masih Muslim never praised Christianity. He only praised the system of government of the British people, not their religion. As far as his, their religion is concerned, their religion was Christianity and as Muslim was now uh, said and written so much about Christianity. In fact, uh, everybody knows that he proved that Jesus Christ, who is God of the Christianity, he, he proved that he, he has died. So once he proved the, that Hasidis al-Islam, Jesus Christ has passed away, that means that the whole edifice of Christianity is demo demolished. So, Nobody should think that he is you know, in favor of uh, Christianity, not at all. He, is, he was only praising uh, British government, but at the same time he has done so much service 
uh, of Islam as against Christianity that even all the people of India and the Scarlet Scholar, they admired Hazrat Masih of Islam and his uh, uh, you know, contribution uh, to the defense of Islam. I think as uh, Bajaj Sahib has yeah. just mentioned, actually this point has to be noted that uh, the prophets of Allah, they always speak the truth. Whatever is the fact of the matter, they always speak it out. And whatever is wrong, they openly say that is wrong. Because they are the people of truth, ambassador of truth, and representative of truth. So as you have pointed out, Hazrat Musihim Aulaiyah praised the government for the good actions, and particularly the religious freedom which was given to the people. And everybody was free to practice their religion, and to preach it, and to enjoy the benefits of the freedom. So far as the wrong beliefs of the people are concerned, no prophet has ever uh, commended that one. Mm -hmm. But whatever is the reality, that is to be praised. Even in case of Jesus Christ, uh, Christianity, so far as the person of Hadrat Isa Islam is concerned, the promised Messiah Islam praised him because he is a glorious prophet of God. He never spoke anything against him. Always said as it is mentioned in the Holy Quran, Vajihan fi dunya wal akhira, that he was a noble prophet. So he praised, he loved, and he mentioned beautifully about him. But whatever is the present belief of the Christian, that they have taken him to be God, or they believe in Trinity, or they believe in atonement, or they believe in the death of Jesus Christ on the cross, all these things which are pillars of Christianity, he strongly rejected all these things. So this is the beautiful balance that we see in the life of the Promised Messiah, Salatu Islam. I'm just developing that point, and I think you know, the whole concept of um, the earth in Islam is the renaissance of Islam. And clearly this resonated quite widely in India. And the promised Messiah, certainly in the earlier days, was recognized as a champion of Islam, a defender of human rights. Indeed, this recognition of human rights and the message and the revival of Islam that Hazrat Masih Mahad brought along is very appropriate to the current age. For example, one of the, you know, bringing it right to the current date and the current debates which are currently occurring, particularly in relation to Islam, is this whole concept of jihad and what it actually means in its true essence. Indeed, I, I know we've got a question here from Shahzad Rafiq Saab, Jazakullah, from Coventry, who sent it in, and I'll just uh, relay that for all our viewers. And he writes, and his question is, if Muhammad wasallam was given permission to physically defend himself from religious persecution, then why do Amdi Muslims not also physically defend themselves from similar persecution? But clearly there was a profound recognition by Hazrat Masih Ma'ad al on the true definition of jihad. Perhaps you can develop that and answer that particular question. Uh, well, I think it's a very interesting question and very commonly asked these days particularly, when unfortunately the beautiful name of Islam is being equated with killing. People say erroneously, that jihad means killing and bloodshed. Of course, and while the fact is very much different. Yeah. But the question that uh, this gentleman has asked, I think in his question lies the answer of the question. Because he himself has mentioned that when the Holy Prophet وسلم, was permitted, only then he took the sword. So it means permission from God Almighty is the most important thing. Unless the permission is given, the Holy Prophet وسلم, did not take the sword. We look at his life. The early part of that, after he was commissioned as a prophet at the age of 40, uh, after that 13 long years, he stayed in uh, Mecca. In that period, such permission was not there, while the persecution was going on. So every day was a day of persecution. Every night was a night of persecution. And the, um, the Holy Prophet Sallallahu and his companions, they had to spend almost three years in Shabi Abi Talib, when they were completely cut off. All the provisions, they were not uh, able to reach him, uh, reach them. So that was really a very, very difficult period. And it was not only one or two days, 13 long years. But as long as the permission was not there, so the Holy Prophet Sallallahu did not take the sword. So he did not defend while the persecution was there. And particularly in this age, coming to this question, that why the Ahmadis do not react in the same way by killing the other people, taking the sword in their hand, while they are being persecuted. Persecution is right. But the question is whether do we have the permission from God to do like that in this age? This is the age of the promised Messiah who is a subordinate prophet to the Holy Prophet and the spiritual advent of the Holy Hadrat Isa that is why he is known as the promised Messiah. 
about that the holy prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has mentioned categorically in making a prophecy in a saying wa yazaul harb that when his time would come he would postpone the fighting the fighting with sword will be postponed that will be no more there that will not be the time when the muslims will be allowed to fight back in in the same way they would not be allowed to pay back in the same coin as the torture is being imposed upon them rather it is mentioned there that they would be defending the faith of islam in the same way as generally the people are attacking the faith of islam and we see that although rumors and uh, misunderstandings and misconceptions are being spread but a very important point is not the sword but the pen and the pen is there the weapon actually in the hands of the opponents of islam in these days they are writing books they are writing fiction their stories newspapers television also comes into that one so these are the ways in which they are spreading a, 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 i mean try to defame islam and spread lot of misunderstandings so that is what is meant there that this is the time to defend by the same weapon which the enemies are using and that is a pen that is why hazrat msih maud alaihi salatu wasalam has mentioned in one of his uh, urdu verse just a part of that he says saif ka kaam kalam se hai dikhaya humne that instead of using the sword we have used the pen and by writing the books he wrote uh, nearly 90 books on various subjects and he always defended this aspect of islam it's a beautiful religion it's a peaceful religion and that is what was intended there so he continued to wage the holy jihad in the peaceful way by using fully to the full extent the weapon of pen a peaceful way of defending the cause of islam and that is how he has performed it indeed i i think all viewers will recognize indeed scholars often when debating about Hazrat Masih Maud Allah Salatu Wassalam talk about his profound defense of Islam through his writings and in the in that particular guys may I remind viewers that um you should be and continue to send in your emails write to us and just for viewers interest you can actually email us on faith matters that's one word at mta.tv I'll repeat that again that's faith matters one word at mta.tv and those who are not inclined to use the email well we've got a fax number for you as well and that's the international uk code which is 442086878037 i'll repeat that again uk 442086878037 i do hope the technology is working well and all things being equal that should have appeared on your screens as well if i can continue yeah because it is as as a current subject as you have mentioned and it's interesting to see that how the concept of jihad before the promised messiah alay salam was taken and how after the promised messiah over the 100 years we now have actually seen some transition in the view of muslims around the world and that has been primarily brought about by the writings of the promised messiah alay salam and after him by the teachings of the khulafa who have guided the jamaat as to the true nature of jihad jihad Uh, previously used to be talked of as fighting in the way of Allah now it has been understood as striving in the way of Allah and we know that Islam is a universal religion and therefore we have to abide by the laws of the country and the laws of the nation wherever we, we live Imam Sahib has rightly pointed out that now is the age of reason and uh, not of uh, holy wars and so the war of the pen that the promised messiah alayhi salam started has been continued by the uh, khalifas of the uh, ahmadiyya community in fact defending the name and the honor of the holy prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and in recent years we have seen following the satanic uh, verses and more recently the denmark cartoons the uh, uh, sermons of hazrat khalifatul masi which have been printed are uh, expound the these uh, views very vehemently and correctly so this is the teaching of islam that we need to portray that have been brought to us and clarified by hazrat masih mahdi alaihi salam this regard doctor zahid yeah. just to pick up on that point if i may is it not you know and you see it now as well whereas other muslims um used to attack the jamaat and the viewpoint on jihad as being erroneous it, far from it they sure. now are actually following the same uh, message and are actually quite vocal in saying that jihad is exactly the jihad definition that hazrat masih mahdi alaihi salam it's very pleasing okay. it's very pleasing to see that where before they would be burning burning the books in the streets and yeah. causing mayhem now the ahmadiyya stance has taken obviously they have taken that on board as well 
and that was one of the functions of the Promised Messiah salam, of uh, removing the misconceptions that had been brought into Islam by people. Okay, I'm continuing. I mean, obviously, this is a very wide-ranging subject, but one of the, uh, again, one of our viewers has written in from Nigeria, and I apologize. I, I think it's Mr. Abijusu um, who writes in and said, how can Islam be perceived as the religion of peace? when it was spread by the sword, which again links in with what we're actually discussing. That's right, yes. Yeah. I mean, uh, this has been or was a concept in the West that uh, when I was at school in junior school, in fact, and uh, very young, this was the Christian concept of the Quran in one hand and the sword in the other. And it was very disturbing, even as a little child to me, that uh, they were portraying my religion in this sense. But we know that there is no basis. If we look into the uh, history of Islam, if we look at the teachings of Islam, there is no basis at all for the statement that Islam was spread by the sword. It is uh, a great injustice for them to um, say that, the, uh, that Islam was spread by the sword. In the Quran, Allah says, La ikraha fid deen. There is no compulsion in religion because matters of faith, right has been uh, distinguished from wrong. So it is a matter of uh, your heart, it's a matter of your mind. So therefore, no one can compel you to either believe or to disbelieve. So if we take that as the foundation of, uh, of our argument, then there is no way that Islam was spread by the sword. Look at the early history of Islam, as Imam Sabez rightly pointed out. In the Meccan period, the persecution was, was so intense. But later on, what do we find? That when the Holy Prophet وسلم, returns to Mecca, victorious on the head of 10,000 followers, what does he do? Does he take the sword in his hand and carry out uh, retribution for all the injustices that the Meccans had thrown against the companions and even against the Holy Prophet ﷺ himself? No, he says, La tasriba alaykum al yom. There is, there is no retribution on you this day. So that was the glorious picture of Islam. And that is the practice and the actual example of the Holy Prophet that we have before us that he did not spread Islam by the sword. If you say that he took part in wars, yes, he did. He went to Medina, but the uh, persecution followed him to Medina. Mm -hmm. He did not go out to wage war. He had got, taken himself away from the port, away to Medina to live a life of peace and to, uh, to spread the message of Islam in that way. But he was followed there and war was waged on him and only then was permission granted to defend and there were many limits that were laid upon, upon the Muslims. I think continuing with what yeah. Dr. Sayyid Sahib is just mentioning, it's a very important point that the persecution was actually brought sure. and the war was brought upon brought him. To him. And the Holy Prophet yes. after suffering for 13 long years, then finally he was given the permission that now you can not only go for war, but it say you, now you are allowed to defend yourself. The right of defense was given to them that you can take the sword and you can defend mm -hmm. yourself. Here a very historical important point has to be added and uh, that is worth noting by everyone that most of the uh, defensive battles in which the Holy Prophet ﷺ took part, they were all fought in the close vicinity of Medina. Yeah. So it means the enemies, they came okay. all the way to attack the Holy Prophet and uh, his companion uh, and uh, other people. So that was the reason that uh, the fight actually took place just around that area. So that is a point, except in such cases where the Holy Prophet came to know that some army is getting ready to attack, where he thought that better instead of fighting them here, if they are already ready to fight, then we should go to that place and fight uh, with them a defensive battle. Mm -hmm. So this point is very historical proof, makes the point very clear. Watch yourself, just in taking this into the questionnaire, I'm sure also was referring to the wars that were f fought under the banner of Islam as some historians would write, you know, particularly the conquering of Spain, for example, which was talked about. Can you briefly just give us a sort of context in the concept of jihad, how that from a historical perspective works? Yes, <coughs> you see, the first thing is that uh, this conception that uh, jihad means fighting, this is totally false. Mm -hmm. well, one particular verse I would like to quote, there's one verse which says, Jahid al-Kufara wal munafiqeen in the Holy Quran, it is stated that, O oh Prophet, you should fight the kuffar. I mean, if jihad means fighting, then it means fight 
with the kuffar, you know, disbelievers, and also the munafikin, that means the hypocrites. Now, can anybody prove that there was any fighting with the hypocrites in the whole life of the early Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? So, if there was no physical fighting with the sword, then it definitely it means that jihad does not mean necessarily fighting with the sword. So, what kind of jihad was being done with the munafikin, with the hypocrites? That was the uh, jihad of preaching, training, education, and you know, trying to trying to trying to make them good and righteous. This was the jihad which was being made. So that means jihad does not mean at all that it is fighting. The other thing is the whole period <coughs> uh, which is uh, spent in fighting. It is calculated that it is almost three months time. Mm -hmm. All the, the fighting which has taken place between the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Muslims and the uh, you know, Meccans. Now the question is that there are there's almost 22 or 23 years lifespan of the Holy Prophet mm -hmm. as his, you know, as a prophet. So what he was doing for the other, <laughs> you know, 22 years approximately, mm -hmm. what he was doing if he, jihad only means fighting, then it means he did the jihad only for three months and the rest of his life he was not doing jihad. Which Muslim will accept it? So that means that uh, jihad has many meanings and uh, as it ha has been explained earlier on, jihad is uh, spending in the way of Allah, you know, your money and your time and your efforts and everything which God Al Almighty has given you, if you spend it in, for the benefit of mankind, in fact, for, for the establishment of peace, then it is a jihad. Now as far as the battles uh, after the Holy mm -hmm. Prophet are concerned, yes, we understand that some battles were uh, fought by some Muslim uh, so-called rulers, mm -hmm. but we are not responsible for them. When we say, we are talk about jihad, or the teaching of Islam, we are only presenting the uh, life of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Our belief is in him that he was the righteous prophet of God. But if anybody else has done something wrong, even if he's a Muslim, we are not responsible for that, nor we can say that uh, it, that's the teaching of Islam. I think that puts it into context, yeah. does yeah. it not, about <laughs> what was, you know, the true concept of jihad against what is political wars which are still fought to this modern age. Indeed, in recent times, so, you had two Muslim nations in Iran and Iraq fighting each other. That can't be described as no. jihad on either side. No, it was a political war. Yes, yes, yes. Jazakal, I think, I think I'm, yes, Imam, jihad, I can just make a more yes. contribution that uh, one form of jihad has also been mentioned in relation to the Holy Quran. Mm -hmm. Allah Almighty says in the Holy Quran, Wajahid hum bihi jihad in kabira. That with the use of the Holy Quran, you wage the jihad which is kabir, which is the great. So, and obviously, Holy Quran is a book, is a, you know, some total of the teaching. So, with that teaching, how the jihad can be done which can result in the bloodshed. So, it was propagating the message of peace, that is also a jihad. And also, the greatest form of jihad. The Holy Prophet Sallallahu has mentioned when he finished his defensive battle on one occasion and he was coming back to Medina, addressing his companions, he said, From a lesser form of jihad, which is a defensive battle. From that, after finishing that, now we are coming back to the greatest form of jihad. That is self-purification. A constant struggle against one's own ego is the highest form of jihad in Islam and that is entirely everybody can see is a purely religious and spiritual struggle. Indeed I think that's a very poignant uh, point to actually cause this particular uh, bring this to a close in terms of this subject matter. I think jihad itself we've heard scholarly di discussion here about the historical perspective we've also heard about the true definitions of jihad the concept of jihad um, you know in the modern age some issues are raised around this whole issue of suicide bombings and its erroneous relationship with uh, Islam. Dr. Zai, just very briefly, if you could just touch on that subject, because it seems to be dominating headlines everywhere, does it not? Whether, you know, it was the tragic sure. events in New York, or yeah. indeed more local to us here a couple of years back, a few Unfor years back. Unfortunately, whenever we switch the television on and there it's has a, been a suicide yeah. bombing, we, we, we yeah. know for sure that the name of Islam will be linked into that, unfortunately, yeah. as it is, because as we have seen, there is no basis uh, for such actions in Islam. There are two things that we need to uh, be clear about, is uh, does Islam condone such actions? 
and uh, if, uh, if not, then why is it still being linked to Islam? Uh, from an Islamic viewpoint, we know that uh, Islam does not permit one to take the life of another unjustly. And if so, it is said I mean, to that's be... That's absolutely clear. That's it's absolutely unequivocal. clear, unequivocal. Yeah. There is no yeah. exceptions to, mm. that, to that. And it is said by the Holy Prophet ﷺ as if you have killed the whole of mankind. Indeed. So that is how great and how severe it is thought that if you unjustly kill anyone, then it is as if you have killed the whole of humanity. So if that is the foundation and the basis of what the Prophet ﷺ taught us, yeah. then there can be no, ju no justice um, or foundation for someone putting on a rucksack full of explosives and detonating it where scores, hundreds of people are innocently killed. So therefore it is a great injustice to say that that is a form of suicide bombing and that is linked to Islam. It's often said that it is, this is Islamic terrorism. And it is unfortunate that the West have coined up this phrase as well because uh, that gives a very negative picture of the beautiful I mean, face of sorry Islam. By its criminal action, is it not? I think this erroneous link that, you know, whether it's the media or others who make that Islam is, you know, somehow complimenting, commending this action, it's far from the truth. I mean, these, as far as I certainly see it, it's, it's criminal actions, and those people are crim uh, committing criminal acts. There's no justification, there's no place for it in Islam with noble religion or indeed any religion. Any, or any other religion, absolutely. Yes. I think uh, during the course of this discussion you have used the word uh, uh, suicide bombing. Yes. I think that needs a bit uh, for more clarification. Mm -hmm. You have rightly pointed out that killing other people unjustly, that is totally forbidden and disapproved in the teachings of Islam. At the same time, taking your own life is also a big crime in Islam. Mm -hmm. It is not approved. Nobody is allowed to take one's own life. People may say erroneously, that, well, it is my life, I mm -hmm. can take it. Actually, if we are the trustees of life, we are not the owners of the life. The life is given by God. And take he it. has the right to mm -hmm. give the life and whenever he gives, mm -hmm. and he has the right to take it back whenever he wants to take it. We are not allowed to take our own life. So the one which is described as suicide bombing, actually, to my mind, they are committing double crime. It's a contradiction, first, yes. Yes, itself, first yes. they take their own life, mm -hmm. and through that, they take the lives of other people. So killing innocent people is a big crime. Taking your own life is also a big crime. And suicide bomber is the one who does two crimes at the same time. Yes, yeah. We say our religion is Islam, and Islam means peace. And a Muslim is a person who uh, is a peaceful person. He declares himself yeah. that I am a peaceful person. Well, if person. a religion is defined so, by peace. So, so yeah. after saying that I am a peaceful person, then you go for suicide yeah. bombing or killing people. How you can justify it? Mm. You see, last week, Hazrat Tamil Muminin, Ayyadullah Ta'ala bin Sraji spoke on the 13 qualities of uh, the Ibadur Rahman, which, mm -hmm. is, uh, which means the servants of the gracious God. Uh, that was, you know, his uh, Friday sermon. Haskalif Tal Masil, Hamis Ayyadullah Ta'ala bin Sraji. In that, you know, among the 13 qualities of this uh, servants of the gracious God, one of them is la yaktulunan nafsalati haramallahu. That they do not kill any soul or any person uh, whose killing has been made f uh, forbidden by Allah the Almighty. So if anybody does that, he cannot be a servant, uh, uh, in fact, a, a true believer, according to these verses of the Holy Quran. Another thing is that the Holy Prophet ﷺ said that if somebody kills himself, he commits suicide, you should not perform his funeral prayer. Mm -hmm. So much is it is rejected by the Holy Prophet ﷺ. Okay. So after this, that how anybody, any Muslim there, there is can absolutely condone this. no room for debate. And uh, I would say to uh, Bilal Aslam Saab from Lahore, Pakistan, I think uh, just in the answers that Imam Saab and Bajwa Saab have given, and indeed Dog Saab just now, we've answered your basic premise of your question, what, what is the Islamic position on suicide bombings? I think it's quite clear from that. If I could uh, once again remind viewers, this is a program for you. You make this program what it is. It's around faith, the questions you want to ask. Ask scholars here in the studio about what matters to you and does faith matter? And I remind you once again of our email address for your questions. Quite simple, straightforward, faithmatters at mta.tv. That's faithmatters at mta.tv. And the fax number, once again, is the UK code 442086876.
8037. That's 44 for the UK, 208 687 8037. If I could now sort of t move on to another subject, which seems to be sort of quite in a lot of many people's minds, is the differentiation. We've talked about Hazrat Masih Mal's differentiation on the concept within Islam, which was the true concept of jihad, is also what differentiates the Amdiya Muslim community from others. And in this context, I know we were in the last particular question. I think we received Andrew Baxter from uh, Newcastle upon time. Thank you very much for your question. And in that relation, Imam Saab, if I could first come to you, is this whole concept which we certainly are passionate about, which is, of course, the noble institution of Khilafat. And Andrew actually writes, uh, how does the system of Khilafat in Amdiya Jamaat work? Surely the role of the Khalifa, who is your ruler, he states in his question, clashes with the role of head of state or country where your communities exist. How is this clash avoided? Well, I think it's a very important uh, point, no doubt. And uh, this is uh, the most distinguishing feature, to my mind, about the Ahmadiyya Muslim Jamaat. Ahmadiyya Muslim Jamaat is the one which is the only Muslim uh, denomination within the body of Islam which has got this uh, blessing from Allah Almighty, which is known as Khilafat, the Caliphate. And by Caliphate, it means that uh, after the demise of the founder of the community, who was a subordinate prophet to the Holy Prophet وسلم, according to the prophecy of the Holy Prophet وسلم, which he explained in his writing a few years before his demise, he said that according to this prophecy, the system of Khilafat is going to successorship is going to be established in our community. So exactly that is what happened. Are we unique in this? Is the we are very community unique. We are unique? the unique because there is no other Muslim denomination at this time which may say that we have got a Khilafat in them. Yes, there are some people who are very keenly aspiring to have one. They are very desirous of having them. They say that, well, let's sit together. Let's do something. Let's, let's pick, pick up somebody. And they have been trying in the past picking various people mm -hmm. and trying to you know, prompt them to claim to be the Khalifa. But nothing worked. Actually, the point is, which these people totally omit, that Khalifa, the successor to a prophet, he is the one who is appointed by God Almighty. It is not appointed by people. We say that the election of the Caliph takes place in the community. But actually, the fact of the matter is that it is Allah Almighty who actually selects that man. The selection is already made in the knowledge of God, in the scheme of uh, divine scheme already there. What the election committee does is that the same decision of God Almighty becomes manifest through their opinion and their verdict. But actually it is the choice of God. It is not the choice of man. So these people who are trying to appoint someone and select someone and say, ask him that you become the caliph, actually they totally miss the point. They say as if it is an institution which is man-made mm -hmm. through the election, through campaigns, through proposing the names, and supporting and opposing and some people. And just from that campaign's point, I mean, there is no campaign. There is no campaign. There is no such... I mean, when the decision is from God, mm -hmm. and that decision is going to be manifested, the members of the electoral college, we have an electoral college in the community. Whenever such occasion comes, people are convened, and they hold the meeting. But that atmosphere is so charged spiritually that there is no such question of anybody even uttering the name of anyone who could be the possible next Khalifa. It is not mentioned. It is all in their hearts, in their minds, which are entirely uh, controlled by God Almighty. And when the moment comes, then that divine verdict, which is already there, that emerges so beautifully that all the people, they bow down to that and pledge their initiation at the end. And that was demonstrable that was uh, here. in 2003. You know, we with our own eyes, you know, yes. in uh, 2003, of the when the fourth uh, Khalifa passed away. And uh, immediately after that, the election took place. And the whole world is witness how it took place. Mm -hmm. And immediately when the Khalifa was chosen, he was instantly made by the will of Allah Almighty, with his command, the spiritual and the administrative head of the Jamaat. I just like to mention one very small incident, which has been mentioned many times, and I think the viewers of MTA must have seen it many times, that when the new Khalifa was elected, Hazrat Khalifa al-Masih Khamis Sayyidahullah bin Aziz, just minutes, couple of minutes after that, he saw many people standing in the mosque and addressing them, he said, sit down. And that voice was carried out to all the people around the mosque. 
I think you were I, I was one there, of them. Yes. I think all yeah, of you I were there. I think all of us were present. So yeah. the, the whole area around the London Mosque were filled with people. Thousands of people were there. And the whole proceeding was being watched on television. When the new Khalifa appointed, he said, sit down. All the people, they sat down. Just like a open field of a crop, you know. When the wind comes, mm -hmm. the, all the crops, you know, it lies down. So just like that, instantly all of them, whether they could find a place or not, but they sat down maybe sitting on top of somebody else, but they sat down. So much so that even some people told me later on that we were watching this proceeding in Australia, in Japan, in Singapore, in Africa, in Middle East, or India, Pakistan, mm -hmm. wherever they were. And most of the people, they were standing in their excitement as to what is happening. So they were standing. And when they heard the Khalifa sit down, they said, we sat wherever we are. So the whole world of Ahmadiyyas, total submissively, in total yeah. obedience, they sat down. And just so taking, this is, that, this is what taking that concept, Dr. Zayed, I mean, just focusing on, Andrew writes in his email, the role of the Khalifa, who is your ruler? Perhaps you can sort of clarify exactly what Khalifa's role is and then why. I mean, I get it, I'm sure, sure. everyone else does about this, that you, they, you know, friends of yours say you have such obedience and reverence towards the Khalifat. What is it? What does it mean to you? I think if you? I can take that a yeah. step, step back first, because what I'd like just to mention here is that uh, this uh, obedience and unity that we see in the Ahmadiyya community is certainly because of Khilafat and nothing but Khilafat. And why the other Muslims have not been able to create Khilafat is, as Imam Sahib has said, that Khilafat is not created by man, it is created by Allah. But even before that, they have to have profit. This is Khilafat on the precepts of prophethood. Mm -hmm. So you have to have a prophet that has to come down and then the Khilafat follows on from that. And this is where the Ahmadiyya community is distinguished from other sects in that the promised Messiah according to the prophecies of the Holy Prophet وسلم, uh, was a, 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 a prophet of God. He was a non-law bearing prophet and this is why the Khilafat that has followed is within the realms of Islam and that is why but just, just if I may for clarification for our viewers just pick up on that point the distinct nature whilst it is following the Prophet just to pick up on that because indeed some other Muslims often challenge the Jamaat on that particular concept of the prophethood of Hazrat Masih what was you know just for the clarity what was the basis of him clearing, declaring as such, and then the Khilafat following it. This wasn't something which was man-made, it was divinely decreed. That's right, this, this, this was divinely decreed that in the latter days, uh, the promised Messiah and Mahdi would uh, arise, and we know that he would arise from within the body of Islam, he would be a Muslim, who would uh, carry out the Renaissance, the reformation of the Muslims, who had uh, gone away from Islam, mm -hmm. and that uh, faith had ascended to the Pleiades. So this was all in, in um, fulfillment of the prophecies of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that despite us believing that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was the Khatum al Which we do. Which we and do the and the because of, that. Yes. And, and that he was the seal of prophets. But the door of revelation has not been closed. So Allah is uh, ever living. He has not died. And he still talks with uh, his chosen ones. And the revelations that the Prophet Messiah was repeatedly receiving more of this nature that he said that God out of his favors and because of my obedience and my love for the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has exalted me to a status of prophethood but I bring nothing new I have no new law I have no new book but I have been sent to carry out the reformation of Islam so that was the Nabuvat the prophethood of the promised Messiah and that is within the laws of Islam that we believe that the Holy Prophet ﷺ gave these prophecies and there are many of, uh, of this uh, that he said that in the latter days a prophet would, would come and there is no prophet between me and that prophet. So he had given many indications of that is a vast subject perhaps of course, it would be yeah. wise to deal with yeah. it in, in another but program. Bajra Sahib, if I could just bring you in here, just picking up on that point, one of the questioners for example Mahreen Sohail from Vancouver in Canada writes why did God raise the promised Messiah from such an underdeveloped country in India? That perhaps you can answer in yours. And then also develop perhaps a bit more about how Khilafat in its manifestation followed on from the period of Hazrat Masih the promised Messiah. <coughs> so first question? The first question was very much about why did the promised Messiah appear in yeah. um, Talha, uh, yeah, in India. Yeah. Uh, 
because yes. it was perceived as being an underdeveloped country. <laughs> yes. Or a developer, to be correct, it's now the, the, the correct title is developing, <laughs> and I think I challenge a lot of people who would put uh, India in not the premier division of uh, many nations. You see, the selection of God yeah. uh, cannot be restricted by any human being. Mm -hmm. God himself says that uh, Allah knows better whom he should just, uh, uh, select and from where he should select him. Allahu yalamu haso yajalu risalatahu, these are the words of the Holy Quran. That it is God's decision that from where he wants to choose any prophet or whom he wants to select any prophet. Mm -hmm. So this is why nobody can challenge God. The other thing is, in, don't they know that the Holy Quran has very clearly said that uh, there is no nation on earth from where we have not raised any prophet. That Allah Ta'ala has been raising his prophets from all nations. So how anybody can say that from that part of the world no prophet can come, or from that part of the world no prophet can, can come, while Allah has already given this mm -hmm. very clear indication that all the people are God's people. And it's the, uh, you know, sort of God's love and mercy that he wants to guide all people. He can't deprive any particular uh, part of the world. So are the Indian people are not uh, God's creation? So if they are God's creation, mm -hmm. then God, why God should not send profit from those people? Okay. Whether, whether somebody yeah. developed or underdeveloped, uh, under yeah. it doesn't mean... I, I think these are man-made uh, <laughs> labels that we attach. Yeah. Yeah. Just coming on to the central, central question, I think, from Andrew, and indeed other questions that we've received on this issue of Nizam Khilafat. Yes. We indeed celebrated last year the centenary of Khilafat, and indeed many people raised, well, what are you actually celebrating? Yeah. What is the concept of Khilafat? Yeah. We've heard that it's divinely decreed, how the election works. But what does it actually mean mm -hmm. to individuals within the community? And I'd also ask the question, what it means actually to people beyond the community as well, mm -hmm. for what it brings? Yes, uh, Tariq Sahib, this, uh, uh, this uh, question of Khilafat is a very important question for every Muslim, and it should be very important. Because the Holy Quran says, that Allah promises and this promise is for those people who believe and also act righteously that if they fulfill these two conditions that Allah's promise is that he will definitely make a khalifa among them, from among them so that means that if there is no khilafat there is no true faith and no uh, righteous actions. So this is why if a group of people or if a community of uh, uh, Muslims say that we are righteous uh, Muslims, then they have to have the Khilafat among them. And at the same time, it means that if there is a Khilafat, then it's the duty of all Muslims that they must follow the Khilafat. Mm -hmm. So now at this time, while there is no other community which has got the Khilafat, then how other Muslim can remain outside the uh, Ahmadiyya community? If they are outside the Ahmadiyya community, they should prove their justification for that. Now I would like to mention, in Islam, there are only three types of authorities. Number one, prophethood. If the prophet himself is alive, he is the authority. When he passes away, then after him is his successor, as the Khalifa. Now the Holy Prophet Sallallahu did say that uh, uh, the Khilafat system which will be established immediately after him, that will be for about 30 years. Yes, all Muslims know, know that. Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq time, Hazrat Umar, Hazrat Usman, Hazrat Ali, Hazrat Allah Ta'ala time. Now, the kingdom system started after that. But then the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that then at the head of every century, God Almighty will send Mujaddid, the revivers of the faith. Mm -hmm. So after that, the revivers of the th uh, faith become the authority in, the, in Islam. So that means there are only three types of people who can have the authority from Allah according to the teaching of Islam. Either the Prophet himself, or then after him the Khalifa, and the third is that when Khilafat is finished, and that you know, prior Khilafat which is in continuous, then the Mujaddad should be there. Now the question is that in the present day, the Muslims, what sort of authority they have? Neither they have any Prophet among them, nor they, nor they have any Khalifa among them, <laughs> nor they have any mujaddid among them. So what sort of authority do they have? Now as far as the Yamadis are concerned, by the grace of Allah, first of all, in the 14th century, the mujaddid who came, that is only Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Muhammad Qadiyan, Islam, who claimed that Allah has appointed him mm -hmm. mujaddid. 
and then after him there was the, the system of Khilafat was uh, established so it was and, a very noble institution yeah. it's been established yeah. and we talk I mean you know we were talking about Khilafat and Khilafat Amdiya here we're in a, quite a unique situation there were four Khulafai Rashidin we're now into Alhamdulillah you know into the fifth uh, divine uh, era of Khilafat and Amdiyat is there a timeline associated with that is there is this now till the end of days? Well, is this a question? It is entirely in the hand of Allah. You of know? course. So we have to see to this one. Particularly in this case, when the Holy Prophet ﷺ mentioned what is going to happen after him. He has mentioned, you know, after him there will be a pious Khilafat there, Khilafat Rashida, then the form, the form of the Khilafat will change and it will continue. Finally, he mentioned Summa Takunul Khilafat Wala Min Hajin Nabuwa. That on the precept of Khilafat, Prophethood, the Khilafat will be established. And that Khilafat was established when Allah, Allah Almighty established the promised Messiah. And uh, he was appointed in that one. And then the Hadith, the wording of the Hadith said, Summa Sakata. Then after that, he kept quiet. The Holy Prophet وسلم, did not mention anything beyond that. That is to say that as the previous uh, period of Khilafat was limited, it finished at a time that it changed different forms. But when the Khilafat, after the advent of the promised Messiah, the Imam Mahdi, who would be a subordinate prophet, then it will be established, then this system will continue. Because the Holy Prophet Sallallahu after that, did not specify any time. time. That is the answer to your question. That it is, Alhamdulillah, we firmly believe, is a blessing which has been given to this community, and it is going to continue forever. Because the Holy Prophet Sallallahu also mentioned like that, Summa Sakata. He just simply kept quiet, and did not say that it will be for such a period, such a period. No specified mention was there. So that is the proof of that one. So this is about the Khilafat. But I think one thing which came up in earlier discussion about the Khilafat, actually the discussion is going so fast. It's, 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 it is. Know, if I could just at this moment remind viewers again, I think we're probably generating more questions along with the very deep and meaningful answers we're getting. If I could remind viewers once again, um, please do send through your questions on faithmatters at mta.tv uh, that's the email I'll repeat it again faithmatters at mta.tv and the fax number for those of us who want to use the fax machine a more traditional method it's UK 442086878037 that's fax 44 for the UK 2086878037 and I assure viewers if I say it long enough and regularly enough I'll probably learn the number myself but coming back yes. to the discussion we're I having think the point I was the, uh, going to raise is that the status of the promised Messiah must be understood very clearly mm -hmm. I think in between the lines of these questions which you have read I could see some people are wondering that how come that after the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam we are no, still no. mentioning about someone who is a prophet but actually the word simply prophet could be misleading for some people because generally what the people have in mind is that whenever we say somebody is a prophet, they always think of a book coming along with the prophet. And a new While religion. A new religion yeah. starting there. While this is not the case, the books which came from God Almighty, they are very few, limited in number. And the number of the prophets who came from God Almighty, they are, according to one hadith, 124,000 prophets came. So it means every prophet does not bring a new law or does not start a new religion as such. But the status of the promised Messiah must be understood very clearly. It is mentioned in the Holy Quran. And that is mentioned in uh, verse number 70 of Surah Nisa, where Allah Almighty has mentioned, That those people who will obey Allah and this Prophet, the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What are these, uh, what are the blessings which these people are going to get? Four spiritual blessings are mentioned there that these are the four blessings which will be given to them. The very first being These are the four categories mentioned there. But this word prophet which is used here, this qualifies the previous one or it is qualified by the previous one which says that those who are obedient to Allah and to this Prophet So it means after the advent of the Holy Prophet Whenever we can possibly talk about the advent of a prophet, it has to be a subordinate prophet. No independent prophet can ever come. No such prophet can ever come who can claim that I have brought a new religion, I have brought a new book, 
I'm introducing some new faith. No such prophet can ever come. And that is And the promised Messiah, salatu wasalam, founder of the Ahmadiyya Jamaat, never ever mm. claimed that he has brought a new faith or a new book or he has started a new religion. His status was a subordinate prophet. He was an Ummati Nabi. He was from among the members of the Ummah of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu but he was declared as Ummati Nabi and that was his status. The link between the Nabuwat and the Khilafat is that the Khilafat cannot be established unless the system of Nabuwat is no longer there. So somebody had to be sent by God Almighty as a subordinate prophet because that is the only window open after mm -hmm. the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Somebody had to come as a subordinate prophet and when he had to pass away, after that the system of Khilafat was going to start. And that is exactly what mentioned. Summa takunul Khilafatu ala min And that system by the grace of Allah is the Khilafat system which is we are enjoying in the Ahmadi Jamaat. And Imam Sahib, we, Dr. Zahid, perhaps I could come to you on this. One of the allegations which is sometimes levied against the Jamaat is that through Hazrat Masih Maud, the promised Messiah, that suddenly a new faith was created, mm. a new religion was born, a new book was created, um, a new kalma mm. was also recited. Mm -hmm. um, can you just clarify for the benefit of everyone, our viewers and beyond, the absolute unequivocal position of where we are? We are well, Muslims. Of, of and course, we I the mean, same book. ask any, any Ahmadi child and he will tell you the basis of our religion. So how do you counter it? You know the, that thing where they say, oh, but they're saying something else in the heart, you know. Uh, that's an allegation <laughs> obvious, obviously levied. I mean, God can only help those people, I suppose. That's right. I mean, we believe in the same book that was brought down by the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We obviously carry out the same duties and functions that a Muslim has to, and they can go to any uh, Ahmadi mission throughout the world, and by the grace of Allah, uh, Ahmadiyyat has spread to the corners of the earth. Another prophecy fulfillment of the Promised Messiah, salam. They can see how we pray, they can see how we fast, um, they can see what our book is, they can see what our kalama is. It is written in blazing letters in our mosques throughout the world. And uh, they will be able to realize that it is none other than what the uh, uh, teachings of the Holy Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, were. They can read the writings of the Promised Messiah and tell us where he has brought a new book, where he has brought a new law, what he has put into Islam. He has been very specific and very rhetorical in this aspect that I have not brought anything new. I have come to reform the Muslims as was the, teach, as was the prophecy of the Holy Prophet And this aspect of that we have something else in our hearts and something else on our tongues is uh, totally, totally baseless as well. And uh, we know of an incident in the life of the Holy Prophet wasallam, when during the course of a battle, a, a Muslim uh, encountered uh, a, a, an opponent, and uh, the opponent at the last minute who was about to be slain uh, recited the kalama la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. And, but despite that, the Muslim unfortunately killed this uh, man. And when they came to the Holy Prophet وسلم, and relayed this to him, uh, and uh, the, he said, Oh, Messenger of Allah, uh, I thought uh, I, I killed him because he recited the kalma for fear of his life. And the Prophet kept on repeating, Did you open up his heart to have a look? Did you open up his heart to have a look? He was so displeased that this companion of the Prophet وسلم, said, I wish that before this day I had not become a Muslim because I had seen the Prophet so much troubled by this. So this is exactly what the Prophet وسلم, was meaning that he was reciting the Kalama. Who were you to say that he was reciting from the Kalama, from his heart or were the, just from his lips? Exactly. And, and that he, is the same yes. for the Ahmadis as and well. And Imam Sahib, perhaps just, I mean there's a couple of questions here. I know um, these questions will keep coming. We've got a couple of viewers but it's been tragic indeed in the modern yeah. age where we see mosques mm. and the Muslim mosques around the world with la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah being erased through government orders and indeed it's mm. tragic yes. and has outraged not just Muslim community but communities beyond as well. And perhaps if I could come to two questions uh, yeah. which you know we can take near the end and again I remind viewers that if you do have questions for our next program it's faithmatters at mta.tv and the fax number is 44208 687 803 8037, that's fax number 44 for the UK, 208 687 
8037. But Imam Sahib, as I was saying, a couple of yes. the questions were on one, why do people claim that the Quran published by the Amdiya Muslim community is not correct? That comes from Muhammad uh, Lakit Sahib. And another lady from Safiya Saiba from Morden writes, what do you say about the general belief amongst Muslims that the Amdiya Muslim community translates the Quran in a way to better serve their own agenda? I think it follows on from what Dr. Zahid was yes. just saying. I think this is a simply based on misunderstanding. This is the result of the propaganda which comes to the minds of the people. And unfortunately, when they listen something wrong, uh, hammered into their minds again and again, then unfortunately at the end they tend to believe that one. That is the only reason for that. The fact of the matter is that the Ahmadiyya Jamaat is in the forefront in the, among the all Muslim denominations in translating the Holy Quran and spreading the message, the word of Allah in the world languages throughout the world. That is one thing. How many languages? 69. 69 complete yeah. translations have already been mm -hmm. printed and so many are there in pipeline. And the selected verses of the Holy Quran, they are already available in print in 120 languages. So that is about the translation. But the point is that whether our translation is different or wrong, I would say difference. So far as difference is concerned, I must say that there are some places in the Holy Quran where our translation is different from others. But the point is that how can these people think that their translation is a standard one? Mm -hmm. I can tell everybody that if they take the five translations done by various non ahmadi scholars, put them together on the table, all five will be different. If they differ themselves, that how can they say that one of our translation is a standard one, is the correct one, and the Ahmadiyya translation is wrong one? Actually, wherever we differ, in any translation with any other scholar, we have got firm reasons for that. In the tafsir e kabir written by Hazrat Muslim Aud, the second caliph, he has gone into detail to describe the meanings that this word, if we have translated like that, this is based on this reason and this reason, this is supported by that verse of the Holy Quran and that lexicon, all these things are mentioned there. So we do not ever twist any meaning of the Holy Quran for our own purposes. And because just to we be clear, firmly it's believe to the letter exactly the exactly same. Exactly, this is the word of God. It has to be done very honestly. And I just give you the example which might uh, move the hearts of some people. Hazrat Maulana Sher Ali Sahib, who did the translation of the Holy Quran in English, and that his translation is considered to be the best in a way, I mean, appreciated uh, throughout the world. He is the one who did the translation when he was living in London. And he has mentioned that uh, every day, whenever he came to his desk in the morning, before uh, uh, starting the translation work, he used to offer two rakats of nafal. Pray to Allah Almighty that, O oh Allah, this is your word, and I am this humble self embarking upon the translation of your word into English. So kindly help me. So with this spirit of dedication and uh, with this spirituality and humbleness, the translation has been done. So all the translations yeah. are there. MashaAllah, the caliphs, the, they have done yeah. it. I, I think this is a profound, I know we're very running very short of time, and okay. inshallah, we shall for the viewers' benefit, continue. There are many questions, um, just to reassure the likes of Dr. Muhammad Sadiq from uh, Newfoundland in Canada. Bilal Salim Saab, thank you for your email from the Bronx in New York, um, which were related to the coming, the second coming of Hazrat Isa al-Islam, second coming of Jesus Christ. Inshallah, we shall be covering, and please, these uh, particular issues in future programs. Again, to all viewers, a reminder for your emails is faithmatters at mta.tv. That's faithmatters, one word, at mta.tv. And the fax number, once again, is UK 44208 687 8037. I wish to, if I may, just thank our panelists for today. First of all, Imam Adal Majid Rashid Sahib, thank you for your deep insight into what has been quite a wide ranging dis discussion. Dr. Zahid Saab, again, for your scholarly contribution to various matters, particularly on the issues which are contemporary in some respects, particularly around jihad and suicide bombing. Of course, Maulana Bajwa Saab here, who's the, also the Imam at the largest mosque here in London, the Battle for Two Mosques. Thank you indeed, mm -hmm. uh, Bajwa Saab, for your contributions. And finally, I want to thank the viewers for yours. Without your emails, without your questions, Faith matters, wouldn't be faith matters. I'm reminded, if I may, and just quote someone a bit more contemporary. We often talk about religion, but faith isn't just limited to those who may be representing religion alone. Um, the words of Martin Luther King, perhaps, who wrote, faith is all about taking that first step. 
even when you don't see the whole staircase in front of you. With that, viewers, Jazakumullah, and we look forward to welcoming you again. Does faith matter? Well, faith does matter. Jazakumullah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu.